Let me introduce our distinguished panel. I will introduce them in the order in which they sit from me. Nearest to me, Kenja McRae. She is joining us from uh, 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 Georgia State University where she is pursuing her PhD. She is a graduate of Spelman College and of Clark Atlanta University. She studies the 19th and 20th century American uh, history experience, specifically around African Americans, African diaspora, transnational histories, women, class, and social history. She also is an associate professor at Metropolitan State College. She is our resident historian tonight and will give us a perspective on the past. Sitting immediately next to her is Elizabeth McNamara who plays roles both on the local and national stage. She is the 18th president of the League of Women Voters of the United States, and she is the chair of the League of Women Voters Education Fund. She was previously an attorney. She's recently retired as the deputy chief assistant district attorney in charge of the office's juvenile court division in DeKalb County. And prior to that, she served as the assistant district attorney since the mid 80s. She has been on the front line of the law she is a graduate of my other institution, Emory, uh, with a BA and a JD as well uh, from Emory. So welcome. She will be talking about the League of Women Voters' work and on the front lines of these issues of voting rights. And then furthest from me is Tanya Washington, who comes to us from Washington, D.C. originally. She's an associate professor of law at Georgia State University, just down the street. She has a JD from the University of Maryland Law School of Law. She then clerked for Associate Judge Robert Bell on the Maryland Court of Appeals. She also earned her LLM from Harvard Law School, so she is a fellow Harvard alum. Uh, her research and scholarship focuses on issues related to educational equity and issues arising at the intersection of domestic relations, race, and children's constitutional rights. She also teaches in a pipeline program designed to increase enrollment of students of color in U.S. law schools. She will be talking to us about the law and voting rights as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Kenja, who will start. Actually, they won't go quite in the order of their seated. It'll be Kenja first, then Tanya, then Elizabeth. They'll each present from their own expertise for about 10 minutes apiece, and then we'll reconvene our conversation. So, Kenja, over. Thank you. And since I'm the historian, I'm going to take us back in time, not too far back. I was thinking, okay, when the universe started, but now I'm not going to go back. <laughs> I have no time for that. Um, but I will uh, take us back up a bit. And a part of my presentation is going to be chronological, but also um, a part of it is going to be about ideas. And I'm wondering if we, when I thought about our rights, our fight, if we should not reframe the way we're thinking about our fight. And um, I looked at some of my textbooks, and um, the picture on the right is, well, that would be your left, right? Um, from Slavery to Freedom, the preeminent sort of African-American history textbook. And it almost gives us the idea that our fight is a linear struggle that leads simply from slavery to freedom. But the way I thought, thought about it is that, okay, our rights, our fight, the struggle continues. The struggle is continuous. And um, so, and I got that from a really popular sort of catchphrase from 60s global uh, freedom movements, a lucha continua, or a lucha continua in Spanish. So the first is Portuguese, the second is Spanish. Um, and it was particularly popular among um, for Limo, or uh, the Mozambique Liberation Movement. Um, and basically, it was framed, yes, it came from maybe Mao, his thought, and it was framed to think of, a, uh, to help people think about struggle as long, continual, and protracted. And I think it applies uh, at least to how we should think about our struggle as well. It's not a, it wasn't a linear, hasn't been a linear march from slavery to freedom, the end. And um, I think I read in the Atlantic, a historian, Jelani Cobb, said it's not, our struggle is not the arc maybe that Dr. King talks about that bends toward freedom, but more like an EKG. What's up, right? <laughs> the ups and downs, right? I also thought 
a lot of the language about the Voter Rights Act of 1965 and its gutting this year is framed in the language of race. I think Scalia referred to Section 5 as racial entitlement. But in actuality, I'd like us to also reframe our thinking and um, think in terms of this fight, this long continual struggle, as a fight for or within the long American freedom struggle. Um, so first I'm gonna take us back to the American struggle for freedom. Uh, back to the early national period, right after the American Revolution. So between 1776 and 1800, Americans were in this process of writing new state and, and the federal constitution and devising a system of politics and they're considering what, who's gonna be the desired person who are the people? And um, this was, in, in, fact, uh, in fact, a revolutionary act, a revolutionary thought process, because they were actually considering, considering middle class people as citizens. And this is contrary, very contrary to the, the practices of what European royalty were doing at this time. So it was revolutionary, okay? So don't get me wrong when I start to critique. <laughs> But leading patriots, the, you know, our founding fathers like John Adams, still liked the idea that our representative government should be preserved and that popular power should be restricted. People's power should be restricted. So this is a long struggle, you know, this struggle for full citizenship and voting rights. So initially in the early national period, property ownership was usually a requirement for voting or holding office. And um, I always stress to my students, you know, you think of property ownership, it's not like your, your phone is your property, your shoes. But um, I've read in some places the equivalent of um, a property worth $500,000 free and clear. Um, so that's, that's a lot and a lot of us don't have access to that. Um, and so having property ownership as a requirement for voting, for holding office, actually served in our history to restrict people's power and maintain the power of the elite. And so republicanism at the time meant rule by property owning men, usually considered a, a people of talents and virtue, but because they were property owners. So the two went hand in hand. Um, 1789, we usually use um, to mark the establishment of our democracy, it, you know, rolling out the Constitution as we know it. Property white men are still the men who can vote. Keep in mind, 1789, the year that we mark as the emergence of our democracy, um, also sees a society where poor people are disenfranchised, women are disenfranchised, Native American Indians cannot vote, enslaved African Americans could not vote. So then I questioned in our title, Our Rights, Our Fight, whose rights? In the early days of the 1800s, the new American white word though knew to be democracy, which meant ruled by popularly elected party politicians. The people would elect them. And newly formed states began to ratify constitutions that allow men without property, white men without property to vote. By 1820, uh, historians think, solidly in the United States, property is no longer a requirement for white men to vote. And so you see this sort of long struggle from 1789 until 1820 where ordinary men, ordinary white men have to fight for their rights, for voting rights. And then I think again, whose struggle, whose rights? Well, this was a fight about women's rights. Women started to engage in political discourse in the early national period Abigail Adams writes about, in defense of, at least in letters to her husband, 
um, women's rights. Eventually, in um, the state of New Jersey allows women and free property holding African Americans to vote. This lasts until 1807, when new laws allow white males without property to vote and restrict women and African Americans' right to vote. So here you saw gangs in New Jersey for women and African Americans, then some rollbacks, so down on the EKG. And then some gains for white males with property. So it's not a linear uh, progression. And we're all involved, really, when we look at history. Um, women, we know, over time, lobby for the right to vote. By 1869, individual states are ratifying um, laws that allow women suffrage. And then we know it's not until 19. 20, that we get the 19th Amendment uh, that allow women the right to vote. But again, this is overlaid by restrictions uh, on African Americans' right to vote, particularly in the South. And so at least African American women who are living in the South, and that's where most African American women live, are not including this in this, uh, this amendment, this constitutional amendment. So some gains, and then some low points, right, in the EKG. And we also know that historically this is um, about immigrants' right. This is immigrants' fight. So from 1770 until 1790, each state has in its own individual naturalization laws. But then in 1790, the United States passes its first naturalization law to grant citizenship, but only to white men and some women. So the right to vote is tied directly to your citizenship status. And we see in <coughs> history, some people are being systematically excluded from citizenship rights. So say, for instance, as the United States acquired the American West after 1848, Hispanic Americans are excluded uh, from full citizenship and thus the right to vote through such statutes as so-called greaser laws. We also know about the Chinese Exclusion Act in 18, of 1882, which excludes Chinese immigrants from citizenship and thus excludes them from voting rights. So they've also been included in a long struggle that, um, that um, uh, sort of pushes them to the margins of citizenship and thus excludes them from voting rights. And so we have to keep in mind that the Voter Rights Act of 1965 includes provisions that um, uh, require so, sort of like information ballots to be passed out in multiple language and that the languages that reach immigrant voters. And so, as I said, a lot of the language of um, the, 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 the um, Shelby versus Holder verdict and, you know, about around the Voter Rights Act of 1965 is about race when in actuality, we need to remember that it's about more than just African Americans, but it is at the heart also about African Americans. And so we can't take, I think, only focus on this long American struggle for voter rights. We have to also focus on the long black freedom struggle for voter rights, which a lot of people say starts at the end of slavery. And it starts in the period of reconstruction. So you have the 13th Amendment passed that frees African Americans from bondage, and the 14th that deals with citizenship. But then you don't get the 15th Amendment, which, which secures voter rights. So for a while, people are thinking, OK, let's make them citizens. But that doesn't actually include the right to vote for them. OK, but by 1869, <coughs> African American males get the right to vote. So up on the EKG, right, uh, sort of measures. And then you have say, over time in the South, over 1,500 elected black officials during Reconstruction. Mm. So from, you know, just hardly any to 1,500. And the Democratic Party, most of them are, you know, they're voting Republican, they're Republican uh, representatives. But the Democratic Party doesn't let this stand. 
And so here's where we're getting into measures that really are addressed by the Voter Rights Act of 1965. They use measures to roll back black, voter, black males' voter rights. And the rolling black, dialing back of black male voter rights is, is a companion to um, a sort of um, curtailing their economic rights and curtailing social freedoms. And so we know they use terror. So groups like the Klan, Klan are used to terrorize African Americans, exercising the right to vote African American males. And then we know they use poll taxes, the grandfather clause, which says if the grandfather could vote in the 1862 election, then he could vote. And um, they use literacy tests. And so, you know, people get different sets of questions, right? The people we don't want to vote get a very, very hard question. Some say, how many? Um, how many uh, jo um, um, marbles are in this glass jar? You know, questions as ridiculous as that. And then the desired voters get easy questions. Right? What's your name? Make sure you sign your name here correctly. Or write your name out. So these types of measures were used to disenfranchise, take away African Americans' votes. <coughs> And this is what people show up, this is part of what people show up in 1963, the March on Washington, to protest these types of practices that, um, say for instance, in Georgia, make it so there are only three elected officials right before the Voter Rights Act of 1965. While by 1990, after the act is passed, you have almost 500. So down to three on the eve of the passage of the Voter Rights Act. Um, and so I think that's the background, that's the context that I wanted people to um, think about. And think of this you know, almost 100 year struggle for African Americans and almost 200 year struggle for Americans in general, for the right to vote, that's never, um, it seems, um, set in stone. The freedom is never had. It's never settled. But there are ups and downs. There are, it waxes and it wanes. And so the struggle continues. We must remember, um, I, need, I wanted to leave you stressing that we need unity in our, in our cause. So that's why I brought up uh, the fact that it's an issue of poor people and ordinary people's rights, and it's an issue of women's rights, and it's an issue of, about immigrants' rights. And we must remember that injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And our story is not just a linear one leading from slavery to freedom, but an ongoing fight for democracy for us all. Thank you. pleased to be here tonight. Thank you to the organizers and the um, Harvard Black Alumni Society, which I hope to join soon. And for, to all of you for being here, and to my son who is looking at his cupcake and scent and very <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here to talk about this subject. One of the classes that I teach at Georgia State is um, Race and the Law, and we spend the first half of the semester talking about history because I refuse to have any discussions about current issues in the law until my students are clear on what has happened historically. Because otherwise you're speaking from a reference point of ignorance, which is not helpful. So, where do we go from here? Um, I'm going to start with a little more recent history. Um, Kenta did a great job of situating us in the historical context. I want to talk about what happened in 2000 and um, if the internet had been working a little better, we would have been, been able to see the opening scene from um, Fahrenheit 
And it's the part of the movie that most people don't pay a great deal of attention to, but it shows black Congress member after black Congress member, and I believe there are other Congress members who are also raising objections to Bush being appointed, I mean elected president. Um, and, and saying to Gore, who is presiding over this, um, presiding over this session, that their objections are rooted in the numbers of blacks that were turned away from voting polls in their districts, right? So we had a record, but because they could not get one senator to sign on to their objection, it never became part of the official record. So we have congressional objections, and then we have supreme denials. And there's what is, has been referred to as the Al Sharpton footnote, which is a non-existent footnote in the Bush versus Gore opinion that should have been there, but Scalia complained about the tone of some of the dissents, namely Justice Ginsburg's, Ginsburg's dissent, where she referenced Florida's disenfranchised black voters. And I was upset that it was just a footnote, because this should be text in the body of the opinion. But even the footnote was too much of a reference, and so it was taken out. So we have no record of what happened in 2000. And my question is, might this have provided an evidentiary record that we could stand on in the Shelby case to show that there is current disenfranchisement going on? We don't just have to look at the history. You know, the history continues. When does the past end? So we have current examples of disenfranchisement, but like the tree that falls in the forest and no one hears it fall, the footnote that doesn't make its way into the opinion doesn't record the history. And so that's where I start with my analysis of what happened in Shelby. And the fact that he called it the Al Sharpton footnote, I just thought was <laughs> hilarious. Um, so we have the 15th Amendment, which Kendra mentioned as a critical part of Reconstruction. And then the Voting Rights Act is the enabling legislation, right? So Congress. Um, passes laws to protect against the infringement of the rights that are provided by the 15th Amendment. And I will talk about um, Section 2 and Section 3 in a little greater detail when I get to this section dealing with where we go from here. Um, but I just want to highlight some of the important aspects of Shelby's holding. And there was a lot of language in there about federalism and states' rights. Now, States' rights, for me, is, is a coded statement, right? It has significance in um, American history. Um, and I've seen several recent Supreme Court opinions that are paying homage to states' rights and waving that banner. And it's, all, it's often been used as providing justification for states to violate federal rights and constitutional protections. Um, so this opinion was greatly rooted in the states' rights rhetoric. The majority was very um, clear about the Voting Rights Act being a significant departure from respect for states' authority over the voting process and voting procedures. And that this, what the Voting Rights Act authorizes, should only be allowed in extreme circumstances, right? So only when you have flagrant violations of voters' rights should we <coughs> intrude upon the authority of states to regulate voting <coughs> procedures. Then they look at the purpose of Section 4, and the court says Section 4 of the um, Voting Rights Act, which provided the formula for deciding which states needed supervision. Right, That's the preclearance review requirement. These states, because of their historical um, treatment of African American and other disenfranchised communities need supervision. We do not trust that enactments that they make to their procedures and processes for voting are going to um, are going to protect constitutional voting rights. And so, the court is careful about saying the purpose of Section Four is not to punish; it's to create a brighter future. And because it is punitive, because we have already arrived at this brighter future, it no longer has a place 
within um, our, our constitutional fabric. We don't need these protections because we've come a long way, maybe. And the court is very excited about all the progress that we have made, and we have made progress. However, and the court acknowledges that there's still some issues with voter disenfranchisement, but in order to warrant the existence of Section 4, that reality has to be so pervasive and so egregious that we're willing to depart from states' rights. And the court takes this revisionist view of history. And you can see that in many of the cases that were decided this term. I say the court took a big eraser, E-R-A-C-E-R, -E to the Constitution and to American history. They are pretending that none of the historical wrongs have current significance. And I don't see the break in history that they continue to raise in these cases to be able to say that we no longer need to um, protect against these violations. My issue with this opinion um, is that in addition to what Kendra raised about um, Justice Scalia making a comment that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is actually a racial entitlement, is that it totally ignores the need for protection, right? It pretends that the reality that people are experiencing does not warrant the use of government protections to ensure that everyone has access to voting. And had that footnote been in the Bush versus Gore opinion, I wonder if that could have been a basis for saying, see, these things still exist, and they still warrant the use of Section 4 and Section 5. So where do we go from here? One of my personal heroes is Charles Hamilton Houston, who's also a graduate of Harvard Law School. And he is often referred to as the architect of the strategy to dismantle the doctrine of separate but equal. And he you know, kind of named that as the focal point of African-American lawyers, activists, grassroots activists and those that were leading organizations, that should be our focal point. All of us should be working toward the dismantling of separate but equal. And so I think we're in a Hamiltonian moment. I think this should galvanize communities, and not just the black community, but all communities that are at risk for having their vote and their participation in society diluted. So when we talk about legislative activism, I want to see coordinated efforts. Kenja talked about all the different demographics that are affected. I really think there's a real opportunity here for us to reach across lines, across color lines, particularly with the Latino community, because they have already been recognized as the demographic that will elect the next president. Given their birth rates, um, and their presence, their increasing presence in the United States, we need to work with them to ensure that their rights are protected because equality is not divisible. If you diminish the rights of African Americans, you are also creating a space to, to um, do the same with respect to other demographics. With women, with poor people, we need to make a coordinated activist agenda and execute. And I know that Elizabeth is going to talk to us about um, the wonderful work that the League of Women Voters is doing and has been doing in that, in that regard. The um, get out the vote efforts, um, they were necessary when Obama was running, but they're going to be even more necessary when he's not. Because just his, you know, the symbolic value of having a first, the first black president on the ballot motivated a lot of people who had never voted to vote and to stand in the rain, risk messing up their hair, right, <laughs> and cast their ballot. We need to have that same sense of urgency in elections where there may not be a black person or a person of color on the ballot. We need to research the candidates and find out which candidates are going to take the needs of our community seriously and be as serious about those campaigns and those elections as we were about Obama's election. So we cannot afford to rest on our world. 
And I know that the League of Women Voters is doing a lot of, uh, of work in that, in that regard as well. Litigation, um, Attorney General Holder is mounting uh, lawsuits against Texas and North Carolina. There have been a proliferation of legislative enactments as soon as shall be, as soon as the ink was dry on that opinion. Um, they were gearing up, they were actually gearing up before, right, before the election. And if anyone watched um, Fox News during election night 2012, you heard the commentators. They were like, something is wrong here. Um, they were questioning the, the viability of the Electoral College. Why do we need it? Um, they were questioning these districts. Because if you looked at the map, the larger landmass of the map was red. But the population centers are blue. And they were like, why is this? We need to do something. So they are doing something. And they're doing something in the state legislative bodies where most citizens are noticeably absent. Down at the Gold Dome, they are wreaking real havoc. And we need to be attentive to those legislative enactments so that we can be um, proactive. right? Before these laws are passed, we can challenge them rather than reactive and trying to get them overturned in the court, which is a lengthy and expensive process. So the litigation strategies that are being used, because Section 4 is, was declared invalid, Section 5 means nothing until Congress reformulates something under Section 4 that the court finds appropriate. And First, we would have to wait for Congress to get itself together and for the federal government to reopen. So we're not sure when that will happen. But the Section 2 and Section 3C are still available as vehicles for challenging um, state enactments that infringe on individuals' voting rights. Section 2 requires um, that you look at the totality of the circumstances. So you can look at all different kinds of considerations that evidence um, an and intent to impose or intrude on someone's voting rights, right? But that's very discretionary in terms of how the court interprets whether all of those different pieces evidence that intent. And the, the language of Shelby does not read as if the court is oriented towards interpreting the evidence presented in favor of those challenging these statutes. So, Section 2 has some challenges. It also allows um, litigants to focus on the results. So instead of just looking at what the intent is, you can look at what impact does it have on the community of voters that are most affected. So that's a little easier to establish than intent. For intent, you really need a smoking gun. You need some legislative member standing up and saying on the legislative record, I am passing, you know, I'm proposing this legislation because I don't want black people or I don't want Latinos or I don't want poor people to vote. And most of them are too smart to say that, right? It's coded language. But you need a judge to interpret that language as establishing intent in order to be successful. So results allow you, a results-oriented um, provision like Section 2 allows you to look at the impact. Section three is intent focused. So it suffers from that challenge in terms of having that smoking gun to establish um, the evidentiary requirement that would allow us to be successful in challenging these state enactments. But I'm excited and encouraged by the fact that the Department of Justice is bringing these claims and bringing them out of the box. Right? They are just as active in challenging these enactments as the states are in enacting them. And petitioning Congress to rewrite Section 4, I just put it up there because it could happen, but you know, pigs could fly. <laughs> so it's, it's on the screen. And education I see as a long-term and a short-term strategy. Um, I think we need education in all of these uh, communities that are vulnerable to disenfranchisement. Um, about these efforts and how important it is to get the vote out um, and to, for people to get out and vote. But I also think for children, for our children in public schools, I mean, a lot of people in the, the generation that actually experienced the civil rights movement, no one had to tell them how important it was to vote. 
because they experienced it. My son is 11. And so all of this is ancient history. He's always saying to me, Mom, you were born in the 1900s. Yeah. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so we need to <laughs> emanate. <laughs> when, when, when he said it, I was like, yeah. It's true. It wasn't that far. <laughs> um, but the reality is we need to stress to our kindergartners and first graders and second graders that voting is important. It is important because if you don't get to participate and who is running the country and who is making the laws, then you are missing a critical aspect, the full citizenship, right? And as Ken just said, it affects your economic trajectory. It affects your social um, mobility. It affects every aspect of your life. And I think we need to focus on raising a generation of voters, right? That it's not optional. This is important and you owe it to yourself and your community to get out and vote. One last point I want to make about legislative activism is I want us to be mindful of um, the voter disenfranchisement laws because we have a significant issue in the African American community and the Latino community of increasing numbers of black men and women and Latino men and women being locked up right across the United States. That also affects their ability to vote even after they've served time. So that is another way that states can further restrict the voting population, not even stopping you at the poll. They are stopping you well before you even get to the poll. So these, um, that needs to be part of the uh, legislative strategy, looking at those laws. And a lot of states are tightening up the laws that they have. In Maine and Vermont, I believe it is. Maybe Rhode Island. Maine and Maine and Vermont, which have very low populations of African Americans and Latinos. You can vote from jail. Why is that? But in other jurisdictions, you know, you can't even vote after you've served your sentence. So these law and they would say, well, that's a race neutral law. It may be race neutral in terms of the language, but it's not race neutral in terms of its effect. And so these are the things that we need to become more educated about and more, um, more aware of and willing to challenge. Well, ignore the law degree, because I'm here to speak primarily from a citizen's point of view. Um, and let me just go back in history to uh, a little bit about that women's movement that got the right to vote uh, for in 1920. Uh, because the League of Women Voters is a direct outgrowth <coughs> of the fight to get women the right to vote. Uh, our founders recognized something I think all of us here know, and that is a constitutional amendment alone is not enough to guarantee uh, that all of those women who were newly enfranchised could vote or would come out to vote. And so the League was founded in order to help all those millions of newly enfranchised women figure out what the laws were in their states. The greatest barriers we have to voting are and always have been the fact that states set our voting laws. They are different in every single state. Believe me, I travel around the country and I have to get a, I have to get a long list and brief it in every new state I go to. Uh, the language is different. Uh, it, it may be early voting in Georgia. It's no excuse absentee voting in another state. This is really, in a mobile society, um, in, a, in a modern society, this is a big, this is in itself a big barrier. And so it didn't take the league very long to figure out that what all those women needed in 1920 uh, in order to figure out how to register, how to get to the polls, uh, what the political process was all about, what the issues were going to be on their ballots, to figure out that every single voter in every single election faces the same challenges. How do I register to vote? How do I get, you know, where is my polling place? How do I get trustworthy information on the candidates and issues that I'm going to see on my ballot? Uh, and the League has been a nonpartisan organization because we also very quickly found out that while the parties were very happy to have women voters, they also wanted to tell women voters how to vote. And we wanted to do it the other way around. We wanted to tell the parties 
um, how it is that women thought, you know, what issues were important to women. So the League has been, for over 90 years, working to educate voters. Uh, we produce those wonderful voter guides, that wonderful voter guide mm -hmm. in, that you will see in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, next month when we all go to the polls to vote in our municipal elections. The League will have been the one to produce that voter guide. And we do the same thing all over the country. We're organized in all 50 states and in many, many communities around the, around the country. So voting rights are near and dear to our hearts. And uh, ju you know, just recently, I'm going to go back. I'm not going to go back to 2000. I'm going to go back to 2005 for just a moment, uh, when the, well, I, th I think Indiana is trying to arm wrestle. The Indiana League is trying to arm wrestle us for this. But here in Georgia, the very, very first really restrictive um, voter photo ID bill was introduced. Indiana was close behind. So in 2005, in those two states, one a state covered by the Voting Rights Act and one a state that was not, uh, introduced very, very restrictive voter photo ID. Uh, I am proud to say that it was our 25-year-old executive director, who was our, lobby, was our lobbyist down at the Capitol, who first saw the bill and was the first to raise the alarm that, you know, we were, at that point in time, if any of y'all remember, everybody was very concerned about whether or not the machines were eating our votes. Um, and that was what the media was covering all around the country. And as I said, our 25-year-old executive director said, stop, this is probably the most significant piece of legislation that we are going to, that we are going to see. Uh, and it took a while for the rest of the civil rights community and the rest of the voting rights community uh, to, to rec it was going through so fast to catch up. Uh, but at the time, and with, and with just Georgia and Indiana introducing these laws, the national media had not really cottoned to what was happening with these laws. It was not until the 2010 midterm elections, and we all know what happened in the 2010 midterm elections, all those same people that came out to vote in 2008 because there was an inspirational candidate on the ballot did not turn out again in 2010. Um, if I can, if I can echo what what we've been saying here, and just remind everybody that it isn't just we don't vote every four years. We vote every year, and we certainly vote in federal elections every two years, and we vote at all levels. It is who represents you in the state house is just as important as who represents you in Congress if you are wanting to protect voting rights, because that's who decides our our voting laws. But by 2010, when there were such huge changes in state houses, suddenly we see a flood of this exact kind of legislation, restricted voter photo ID, cutbacks in early voting, which was something that was introduced after the 2000 election as a way of alleviating those long lines at the polls. Very, very popular with American voters. And I think in 2008, 19 million Americans voted during early voting periods. Uh, restrictions on voter registration drives. An awful lot of nonprofit organizations, including the League, do voter registration drives. We can get to, into places and we can be available at times when registrars cannot. We can work outside office hours. We'll work on weekends. Um, in Florida, in particular, we saw a lot, we saw horrible punitive restrictions on organizations like the League trying to register voters and. Uh, voters in underserved communities are overwhelmingly registered to vote in that kind of in that kind of a registra in those kind of registration drives, and that is just to name the most common and the most popular restrictive legislation that we started seeing in 2010. Well, now suddenly the mainstream media is catching up with us, and we're getting a lot of attention uh, to these kinds of kinds of issues, and the, the, we were able uh, through a coalition of a lot of citizens groups uh, to, to fight back or beat back a lot of these laws in many, many states uh, prior to the 2010, 20, the 2012 election. Uh, in the state houses, if there was a, particularly if there was a split, a party between two houses in, in a state legislature, they could get blocked. If there was a difference in party uh, of who the governor was, you know, the governor's party, we could get them, we could get them vetoed. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if we couldn't do it in the state house. We were then going to the courthouse. Uh, many of y'all are familiar with the uh, with the um, Crawford versus Indiana case, which was the very first voter photo ID uh, case that got to the, the United States Supreme Court. 
uh, too early with not enough evidence and under section two because Indiana was not a covered jurisdiction. Ironically, Georgia's voter photo ID law also went to court, did this go to the Supreme Court. Uh, we didn't push it that far. <laughs> under section two, because a political appointee in the Bush White House had pre-cleared the law over the objections of the civil servants in, in the DOJ. And I can tell you from our experience in Georgia and the experience in Indiana, the difference that, going, that having to use section two makes. First off, you have the burden of proof. I'm a career prosecutor, and I know what a burden of proof means. Um, you can't, the, the jurisdiction does not have to justify what they're doing. You have to prove that there is a problem. Uh, and that can be really, really difficult to do because we have a very, very complex relationship in the courts with voting uh, in this country. So Crawford was a bad precedent. You know, we were unable to block the laws in Georgia. So when we can't, got down after 2010, what we were recommending um, from our national office to our leagues was use your state constitutions. And the state <coughs> constitutions we could, were successfully employed in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, and in a few other places. We used Section 5 where we could use Section 5. It was incredibly important in South Carolina and in Texas in 2012. And the upshot of all of this was that by the time voters went to the polls in 2012, uh, only in four states, Georgia, uh, Indiana, Kansas, and Tennessee did voters have to show the restrictive voter photo ID. We've been able to either delay or defeat those laws every place else. Um, the Florida League was able, and, Florida, and other organizations in Florida have been able to get back into the voter registration business in um, over the summer of 2012 thanks to effective court action. Uh, and we were able to block attempts to purge uh, voter rolls for felons and illegals in several states that were attempted at the last at the last minute. Um, these were six very successful delaying actions. <coughs> but ultimately, when we got to 2013, we knew that these all the, first off, these lawsuits are all still pending. And secondly, we knew that we were going to have we were going to see a new wave of legislation. And we knew the Shelby decision was coming down. There were two significant decisions this year in terms of voting rights. The Shelby County case um, talked about the other case was Arizona versus ITCA. I don't know about it. anybody here. Everybody here familiar with the National Voter Registration Act, Motor Voter? Georgia, I'm proud to say, back in the day, uh, was one of the very first states to fully implement, implement Motor Voter. So I love the EKG um, analogy because, yeah, it's kind of been up and down. And so some very, very good things and, then, and now some rather <laughs> unfortunate things here in Georgia. Nevertheless, there was a, a number of states that have been requiring proof of citizenship documentary proof of citizenship in order to register to vote. Uh, the crux of the National Voter Registration Act, there are lots of pieces of it, but the most important part for these purposes is that you can use a single federal form uh, to, for everybody to register to vote. It was in New York last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, for National Voter Registration Day doing an event. One in four Americans is, who is eligible is not registered to vote which is a sad, sad figure. Um, but as our volunteers were going around Bryant Park in Manhattan, which is right behind the library, of course, what are we finding? The workers there that are eating lunch don't live in New York City. But because of the federal form and because of, of computer access, we were able to give them information um, on voting. And had we, we, I don't think the New York League had the federal form, but if we had the federal form, each and every person would have been able to register. We could have just sent that form to the, prop, to the proper authorities. Arizona versus ITCA was a good case out of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed that Arizona could not Christmas tree uh, that federal form, you sign an affidavit on that form saying, I'm, you know, I swear on penalty of being prosecuted for a felony. Um, that I'm a citizen of the state, I'm eligible to vote, in, in the United States, I'm eligible to vote in this state. The Supreme Court said, no, that, that's the law of the land, and Arizona cannot require, the states must accept and use the form. Um, well, they're not, you know, neither Arizona nor Kansas are taking <coughs> that line down. Uh, they have now, most states have now created different classes of voters. Uh, if you use the federal form, you will only be you will only be handed a ballot that has federal races on it uh, because you haven't provided proof of citizenship. If you use the state form and give the documentary proof of citizenship, you get the full ballot. 
Now, does that want anybody? Anybody ever worked an election? Yeah. I want you to think of how confusing that's going to be for poll workers. How expensive that's going to be for the state to have two separate ba have to have two separate ballots, even if you're turning it on and off on a computer screen. It is going to be a mess. But both Arizona and Kansas have decided that this is their response uh, to the Supreme Court, and I, you know, it's all too soon to tell what's going to happen. Um, obviously, right after the Shelby decision came down. I think the ink wasn't dry on the opinion when Texas, that had been blocked from a, a redistricting plan that had been found to be intentionally discriminatory, put their redistricting plan into play, started to implement their voter photo ID. South Carolina, um, Alabama, and Mississippi had been holding fire on their um, on their voter photo ID. They're implementing. North Carolina has gone absolutely out of its mind. Uh, with voter like because they were only partially covered, but nevertheless, suddenly we're seeing cutbacks in early voting. Uh, Same-day registration, which many states have, really cuts down on lines at the polls, because if you have a registration problem, it produces most of your lines. You can solve it right there. That is gone now in North Carolina, and voter photo ID has been put into place. So we have got, we have seen some really bad stuff continuing to come down the line. The issue, of course, is what can we do about it? What can, what can citizens do about it? We know here in Georgia that our, voto, our voter photo ID law is in place. As a matter of fact, um, just so that everybody knows, Georgia's being held up as an example of why voter photo ID laws are not discriminatory. Because we do have um, a large African American population, and those voting numbers, thank goodness, are, are good, and they have stayed steady despite the implementation of the law, and so we are being used as the reason why these laws don't discriminate. Uh, there's got to be something wrong with that. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's been a, you know, at this point, we don't have enough, we do not have enough data, because remember who's collecting the data, to be able to parse and figure out what it is um, <coughs> that's actually going on, and it's almost impossible to prove who hasn't registered to vote or who hasn't gone to the polls because they don't have the requisite ID. I do know, thanks to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, that 26,000, at last count, free IDs have been issued here in the state of Georgia uh, following. So we know 26,000 people did not have what they needed to have uh, in order to be able to go and vote. And if you all have looked at your registration site, this is not just a question as we're discovering of, do you have a driver's license or do you have one of these forms of ID? It's also a question of the raft of documents that you now have to produce in order to get your driver's license. I'm really hoping by the time I have to renew mine, they will have come to their senses and everybody will be tired of this. But you're going to need a birth certificate. If you're married, you're going to need a marriage. You're going to need your marriage uh, license. You're going to need, you got to bring in proof of where you live. You need, I mean, if the, you're, you're your social security card, which I haven't need, needed since it was issued to me, and I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, <laughs> um, you've got to bring with you in order to be able to get that do those, those documents. The and I'm going to mention Texas because it's an interesting example, and I only heard this yesterday. But one of the things that was very interesting about the preclearance process for the Texas voter photo ID law, we when it was done in court. It was not done simply through the administrative process with the DOJ. And in the court case, for the very, very, very first time, at least in my experience, the court, the, the DC court recognized a few things, that, a few realities. Number one, um, most of the folks, this was aimed at Latinos, and most Latinos, on the, you know, a huge majority are, of Latinos, or many, many poor people, a huge majority of poor people in Texas are Latinos. Um, you had to get the law, you had to get the ID in one place at the Motor Vehicle Bureau. And they aren't open except during business hours and not every day of the week. And Texas is a big state, there are not very many of them, and they're very far away. And you had to bring in all of these documents that were really, really hard to get and cost money in order to be able to get it. So, yesterday, uh, yesterday as a matter of fact, I was talking to the president of our league in Texas. Texas is one of the states that is being sued by the Attorney General's office, uh, and I think it is because 
that their redistricting was found, has already been found, found to be intentionally discriminatory. So, okay, so you've got one big bur you know, piece of your burden met under Section 2. And, of course, what else, what else the Attorney General is asking is that Texas be bailed back in by the court and required to go back under preclearance because of their behavior. So what I heard is that as they're rolling out their ID law, they're waiving the, the document requirements, they're opening their, their, uh, their DMVs longer, they've created mobile sites in order to reach as many people as possible, and obviously we are doing this because we don't want to be seen as having bad behavior, we don't want to be bailed back in, and as um, our president out there said, at the same time they are proving the power of preclearance to help modify that behavior. So it was a, it was an absolutely fascinating look into you know what has been happening afterwards, and it is kind of hopeful. We'll see you know maybe you know maybe this is maybe if the, if the attorney general can keep up the pressure, um, we can we can make some progress here, and we can make you know make our point that preclearance is actually a much more efficient and much more effective way of handling states that have had a history. But there are other things that we can all do. As I said, it's a fact of life here in Georgia. So what, what, what are we going to be able to do about some of these restrictive laws? Um, to begin with, we can, we, can, um, we can educate ourselves about the process. A lot of the reason that folks are supportive, that the public is supportive of these laws, is they do not understand how an election is run. They, do not, they, don't, they don't get it. They think that as long as you have you know, a driver's license, no terrorist can get you on an airplane. And you know, there nothing bad can happen to you at the polls, and nothing could be further, of course, from the truth. So, what is a great way of educating ourselves about about um, elections? We need poll workers. We need poll workers everywhere in this country, and we certainly need them in Georgia. And that is something that each and every one of us can can pretty much say, pay you, but it's pretty much you're volunteering to do it. They'll train you. It's a very, very, very long day on election day, but it's a real education in how in how polling places actually work, how the election process actually works. So we can have some facts that we can respond with when folks are saying, "Well, you know, um, 200 you know, regularly." I heard this actually in Pennsylvania. Regularly, more people vote in our precinct in Philadelphia than are registered. And I'm thinking to myself. That, of course, is a poll worker problem. Um, but nevertheless, I had not, on the day that I, that, that I had gotten challenged with that, I hadn't looked at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This was in September, before the election. I opened my newspaper, and there are the stories about 23,000% turnout in some Fulton County precincts, because if anybody recalls, um, the election, the registrar had not told people where they're new, they've been redistricted, and they hadn't told them where their new polling places were. 23,000% turnout. Every last one of those folks showed photo ID. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't quick enough. I hadn't looked at, at all of this stuff. So we learn things. We start learning things about our election process. We have facts that we can deal with when we're talking to our elected officials about why it is perhaps we're not going to repeal these laws, but perhaps we can start to expand them. Um, Jason Carter is my state senator. He's got a bill that is that is currently pending to at least push out the the types of IDs that are accepted. Right now, they'll take ID from um, from state schools, but they will not take. If you go to Emory uh, and you want to vote in the state of Georgia, which by the way you are completely entitled <coughs> to do, you may not use your Emory um, ID to do that. So he's trying to at least expand it out. You know, we can inch those laws out. To the point where they're not as so that we ameliorate them. Uh, we can we can also uh, do our best. We can volunteer to get out there and register voters. Uh, the League of Women Voters right now is working with the Secretary of State's office and the um, and the naturalization whoever is doing nat naturalization now under Homeland Security to register as many new citizens as possible. We can change the face of the electorate. Registration is the absolute key. If you are registered, it increases astronomically the chances that you're going to turn out to vote. So if we can get out there and register folks, if we can get into high schools and community colleges, where a lot of times kids are over, most kids that aren't going into the traditional four-year college program, we can capture 
and register a lot of kids that might not otherwise be touched. And that's one of the <coughs> focuses of the league. Um, we can work with, I know Sheriff Brown in DeKalb County had tried to have a program. I think he ran afoul of not a federal election law. I think he ran afoul of something to do with the registrar. He was actually trying to run a voter registration drive into DeKalb County Jail because obviously if you haven't been convicted, the fact that you're in jail doesn't mean that you can't vote. Um, we can we can do things like that. We can stay on top of our state representatives and because they're the ones making the decision. We can give them the facts, we can give them our opinions, we can not assume that they're not going to change their mind, that they're not going to change their minds about some of this stuff. We could use to, to expand early voting back again. We cut it in half for the 2012 election. Um, nevertheless, the same number of voters turned out during the early voting period, something like night, a lot of voters, uh, as did in 2008. We're not in the financial situation we were, and that was the excuse that was used. We can try and expand early voting. We can go back on the offensive and start thinking about proactive ways that we can reform our system. Uh, the Secretary of State is talking about an online voter registration system. For young folks, young folks are enormously impacted by these ID laws for any number of reasons, not the least of which is that they're more mobile. Than the, rest, than the rest of us. And it ain't easy to get a driver's license anymore when you change states. Um, but if we could do, and they're, they're going online. They're going to be used to being online. We have the downside that any online registration system we have here in Georgia is going to require you to put in some form of a government-issued ID number. But getting the online system, we can start, we can, again, start pushing the outside of that envelope if we can get a system in place that works for more people. We can start. We can we can start talking about permanent, portable registration here within the state of Georgia. What could be more secure, right? Automatic, perhaps even automatic registration at the age of 17. A lot of states will pre-register, particularly with motor voter, will pre-register 16 and 17 year olds because that's when they go and get their driver's licenses. They don't come back again, of course, until they turn 21, um, and they want another dri new driver's license for another reason. Uh, but nevertheless, a lot of states will pre-register those, those kids. But if it was permanent and it was portable, then you wouldn't have to worry about whether you, had, you were in the right place or where you, you were in the right precinct if you went out to, you know, if you were at the University of Georgia um, or if you were, you know, someplace else in the, you were at Valdosta State or someplace else in the state that you had time to vote. Uh, some standards for early voting. And, for, and, and perhaps, very, very importantly, let's make sure we have adequate polling place resources. One last story, and then I will shut up, and you all can ask questions. One of the real, one of the real concerns in the voting rights community after the Shelby County case in, in states like Georgia is that it's those little, itty-bitty local decisions that get made that formerly had to be pre-clear that will no longer need to be pre-cleared and can make an enormous difference on election day. And I'll give you an example. Carroll County has a new, regist new registrar. Uh, not a registrar is trying to do anything bad, um, but because of the popularity of early voting, I think this is a she, uh, suggested that they could cut their polling number of polling places down, uh, pre pol polling places in half. Mm -hmm. She's not intending to do anything bad with any of this, but the county commission thought, oh, what a great idea. Um, they did not get any public input. And the a league member stood up at a commission here, or a, a, I think the city council hearing, and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe we should ask people before we do this. Maybe this isn't a great idea. And the, the good news is, is the registrar said, yeah, that's terrific. The city council said, you know, I think that's a really good idea. The commission rescinded its vote. Uh, and so they are now going to put it out for public comment. But those little kinds of decisions that can be made very, very innocently can have a huge difference in who stands in line because not everybody does on election day. So polling place resources, paying attention to who your election administrator is. How many of y'all live in Fulton County? How many Fulton County residents? Yeah. Um, Fulton County has been a, just like a, a, like a, a perfect case of why you need to pay attention to who it is uh, and what kind of decisions are being made in your registrar's office. Big issue in Fulton County over the last bit has been that um, you know some very bad decisions, some bad personnel decisions were made, and so people you know register on, on, on 
weekend before the election, instead of putting in new voter registrations, they were answering the phones, and there was a huge problem on election day. Those kinds of things are things that we can know about as citizens. There are, there are public boards that govern our elections. We can insist on going to those things. Uh, we can insist that those meetings be open, because they're not always. We can use all of those laws here ourselves to make sure that uh, we are making the best use of the laws that we do have um, and eliminating as much confusion as possible on election day. There is a lot of hope and there is a lot we can do uh, if we stay active, if we stay vigilant, and we stay affiliated with organizations like this or organizations like the League who are dedicated to making a difference in this area.